Morning, everyone. I changed this up a bit uh, yesterday. You'll let me know if uh, it was better before. I'm uh, I'm a big fan of the hip. Yeah. Morning, everyone. Come on in. We'll wait a minute or two till everybody comes in. Like I said, I changed. Uh, well, actually, I changed the shelving shelving on which uh, the camera stands. And it's a uh, slightly lower. If uh, if it was better before, let me know, and I can always move it back up. Uh, Matthew's asking if you can just say that the limit is x goes to infinity of r tan x is pi over two. That's fine. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was going to start with uh, one or two questions, one of which will make that assumption. Why don't we take one or two questions while people are trickling in? Now I see all your comments so well. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, I mean, I have the live chat, which takes up about a third of the screen. So I'm able to see it uh, pretty well. Did we do this question last class? Very well. Let's, uh, I thought I thought I skipped that. Very well. Thank you. So let's do twenty six. I. Eh? What section is this? Uh, I'm not sure what section that is. Maybe 11.6. James is suggesting the root test. Right, well, David's going to be the same thing, right? I, I actually changed it. That, that was actually number 26, but uh, it's all good. Let's do the root test as suggested. So limit of arc tan n to the n to the one over n, which of course just leaves you with arc tan n. And uh, I forget who was asking this, but can we just say that the limit of arc tan n is pi over two? Indeed you can, because you know it. You know it to be true, right? Arc tan of infinity, in other words, when is tangent infinity, it's infinity of pi over two. Conclusion, pi over two is bigger than one. So the series diverges. Has the midterm date been decided? Um, it has not. It has not. Somebody's asking if it's a geometric series. 
It actually is not, right? It, it kind of behaves like a geometric series, right? As n gets larger and larger, this is getting closer and closer to pi over 2. But it's always changing. Whereas in a geometric series, the base does not change. Approximately when is the midterm season? I would say end of October, early November. Maria is asking where the 1 over n comes from. Well, what are we doing here? We are applying the root test. And the root test tells us to take the nth root. Exactly that. Questions on ratio and root test? Anybody? How are we doing with that? Are we lagging behind in the material? You know, I'm, I'll be honest. Um, we're going a bit slow. We're a bit slow. Uh, well, whatever. It is what it is. I mean, is it too slow for you? Are we uh, getting bored with this? We can go faster? Certainly. Certainly we can. So, moving on. Well, I mean, look, I, I, I understand that. Uh, th thank you, thank you, yes, I, I, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Um, Look, I mean, uh, I, I understand that this online business isn't the best. So, you know, I mean, uh, we're going a bit, a bit more slowly. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, Anthony uh, suggests we should do another error approximation. We'll, we'll do that today, absolutely. Uh, so all of the tests we've considered so far have to do with series of positive terms. Now, the question arises, what about series with both positive and negative terms? Suppose we have a series, AN, which takes on both positive and negative values. What then? Well, in this case, two questions arise naturally. Does the series converge? Certainly an obvious question. And does the series of absolute values converge? Right? This is going to be different from this. Here, you're making everything positive. So these two questions arise naturally. Right, from this series of positive and negative terms, we can construct a series with only positive terms. And we ask the question, does this series converge? So, right, I mean, these two questions arise naturally, theorem. If the series of absolute values converges, then the series itself converges.
And let's prove it only because this theorem is an important one. It's going to tell us that this convergence is a very strong one. So strong, in fact, that it implies convergence of the original series. So proof. What do we know? We know that AN is less than or equal to its absolute value, right? If AN is positive, then these are equal. And if AN is negative, then this is a negative number, whereas this one is positive. So this inequality is immediately true. And similarly, if you multiply this by negative one, you get negative an, an absolute value is less than or equal to, well, let, let, let's not multiply by negative one, but the but this inequality is true as well, right? I mean, here, if an is positive, since this is a negative number, the, the inequality is true. And if an is negative, then this is just an. So they're equal. And let's bring this to the other side. So if you bring this to the other side, you get an plus absolute value of an is bigger than zero. Right, bring that over. And now replace this an with the absolute value. So this is going to be less than or equal to absolute value of an plus absolute value of an, which is twice the absolute value. So what are we saying? What are we saying? We're suggesting that we have this inequality. But now, this is convergent. This converges by assumption. So this series converges by, why does this series converge? Since this one converges, that one converges by, by the comparison test. Right, because you are dealing with a series of positive terms, that's very important. So this series converges, but this series converges by assumption again, so the sum or difference is going to converge as well. And this is just a very nice. Very nice. Did we prove that they are the same sign? And Louis Julien is asking, do both series need to be positive to be used in the comparison test? Absolutely. Right? All the tests we've done are for series of positive terms only. Did we prove that they are the same sign? I don't know what you are referring to. I don't think we proved anything was of the same sign.
Is it still a proof if we do things by assumption? Well, we made no assumption here, right? Where does the negative come from? I don't know what negative you're talking about. This one here? All I'm saying is since this converges and this converges, I can add or subtract two convergent series and still get a convergent series. Negative in the beginning here. Well, I mean, if you were comfortable with this inequality, I'm just saying that there's a similar inequality going the other way, right? Here, if AN is positive, they're equal. And if AN is negative, this is negative and this is positive. So of course, this is gonna be bigger than that. Same thing here. If AN is positive, this is positive and that is negative. So of course the inequality is correct. And if AN is negative, then convince yourselves that they're both equal. So it's still fine. Chloe is asking, does that mean if AN is a series of absolute values diverges, so does AN, it does not mean that, right? So if this converges, then that converges. If this diverges, then that diverges. So I did not multiply the whole inequality by negative one. It's actually, it's actually, yeah, I did not do that. I'm actually uh, applying the inequality to negative n, to, to, to negative a n. Replace a n with negative a n if you want. So you get negative a n is less than absolute value of negative a n, which is really the same as absolute value of a n, and now interchange. When we add or subtract two convergent series, the result will converge for sure. Absolutely, right? Because you know that to be true for sequences. And a series is really just a sequence of partial sums. So, isn't the first inequality stated enough for the proof, right? I mean, because this inequality well, I mean, you, 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 you want, I wanted to justify this zero business. Last line of the left side. Well, I mean, it follows from these two inequalities, right? That this is bigger than zero. And then replace a n with absolute value of a n. You're making the whole thing bigger. There it is. So again, if the series of absolute values converges, then the original series converges as well, regardless of whether this had positive and negative terms. So this convergence is a very strong form of convergence, which leads to the following definition. The series AN is said to converge absolutely or to absolutely converge Absolutely. If the series of absolute values converges. Right, and this theorem tells us that if this converges, then of course this one converges as well. If the series of absolute values diverges, 
but the series itself still converges. Right, it's a possibility. Then the series AN is said to be conditionally convergent. Or to converge conditionally. Now, establishing conditional convergence, what is this test called? It's not a test. Not a test, it's only a definition, right? I'm uh, defining what it means to be absolutely convergent versus, versus conditionally convergent. Now, establishing conditional convergence is very difficult in general. But there is one easy exception. Definition, a series of the form negative one to the n a n or negative one to the n plus one a n where the a n's are bigger than zero. is called an alternating series. Right, because it alternates between positive and negative terms. This is always positive. So when n is even, right, I mean, if you're starting at zero or wherever, you'll get a positive term, and then negative one to the one, which is negative, you get a negative term, and then a positive term, and so on. Let's illustrate with an example, of course. Negative one to the n plus one, one over n. Let's write down the first few terms, see what happens. Right, as suggested, sometimes it's hidden. We'll see a few examples of that. But let's just go ahead and write down the first few terms. When n is 1, you get negative 1 squared, which is 1, times 1 over 1. So first term is 1. Plus, when n is 2, you get negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1. So negative 1 over 2. Plus, when n is 3, you get negative 1 to the power 4 which is positive one over, over three, and so on and so on, right? Minus one over four, we see what's happening. Minus one over five, minus one over six. You see what's happening, right? The series alternates between positive and negative, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on. It's an alternating series. Why does AN need to be positive? Well, imagine the scenario where this would alternate as well, thereby canceling the alternating part here, and then you wouldn't have an alternating series. Let's take another example. Right, so here we have an example of an alternating series. If we consider the example though, 
one plus one half minus one third, plus one quarter, plus one over five, minus one over six, and so on and so on. This is not an alternating series, right? It does not alternate between positive and negative terms. So, right, I mean, you've got two positives there and then a negative here. Two positives and a negative, not alternating. Uh, Gabriel is asking if there's a term to refer to series that have both positive and negative terms, but are not alternating. I don't know that there is. We usually just call them series with both positive and negative terms. So I was suggesting that Establishing conditional convergence was very difficult in general, except in one special case, namely the case of alternating series. In this case, we have the alternating series test. Alternating series test, and what does that say? Let this be an alternating series. If one, the ANs are decreasing and two, if the limit of AN is zero, then the series converges. this without proof. The proof is a bit technical, so we're not going to worry too much about it. Uh, what we will do, however, is observe that alternating series can be approximated quite easily. So no proof, but consider this. Shouldn't one have absolute values on them? And that's exactly why, as Louis suggests, the ANs are bigger than zero. So no need for absolute values, right? Because the AN part is always bigger than zero. It's the minus one to the N that makes it alternating, not the AN itself. What do we want to observe? Suppose, suppose this uh, satisfies uh, 
we started at one or wherever, it doesn't really matter. Suppose this satisfies the hypotheses of the alternating series test. Right? Meaning that it is, the ANs are decreasing and the limit is zero. Then the difference between what the series converges to and a sum from one to n, say, right? You can approximate the series by adding the first n terms. What is that? Well, that is, of course, as always, just the sum from n plus 1 to infinity. Which is minus 1 to the n plus 2 and plus 1 plus minus 1 to the n plus 3 and plus 2 and so on and so on. Let's factor out a negative 1 to the n plus 2. If I factor out a negative 1 to the n plus 2, what am I left with? I'm left with an a n plus 1 minus a n plus 2 plus a n plus 3 minus a n plus 4 and so on and so on. How did we get n plus 1? I'm just saying. Since this satisfies the hypotheses of the alternating series test, you know it converges, and that's the conclusion. So this converges. We're going to approximate it by adding the first n terms. So what's the difference between the sum from 1 to infinity and the sum from 1 to n? Well, the difference is that tail end of the series, the sum from n plus 1 to infinity. So now that we've factored out a negative one to the n plus two, let's take the absolute value. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. absolute value of negative 1 to the n plus 2, regardless of what that is, y is the exponent n plus 2. Yeah, y is the exponent n plus 2. Thank you. Should be n plus 1. So I'm factoring out an n plus 1. Still get that. And it really doesn't matter. Thank you. Right, and, and regardless, absolute value of negative one to the n plus one, that's just gonna be one. So that's not a big deal. What about this? What is the absolute value of that? Well, I've rubbed it off now, 
But in the hypotheses of the alternating series test, we assumed the ANs were decreasing. So this is going to be bigger than that. And so this difference is positive. This is going to be bigger than that. So this difference is positive as well. And you're adding, right? I mean, if you group it properly, you're adding a bunch of positive numbers. So it has to be positive. So I don't need the absolute value. But now let's group it the other way. Let's group these two together. Again, Jad, didn't we say, yeah, we did say that, exactly that. So that AN minus AN plus one is positive or AN plus one minus AN plus two is positive. That's exactly what I'm using. And now if we group it the other way, this is bigger than that. So minus this plus that is going to be a negative number. Tiffany is asking what happened to the negative one. It's an absolute value. So it's just one. So this is negative. Minus a n plus 4 plus a n plus 5 is going to be negative as well. And if you group it two by two, skipping the first one, they're all negatives. So now I've got a n plus 1 and I'm adding negative stuff. This is less than or equal to a n plus 1. So you see what we get. This is equal, 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 less than or equal to a n plus 1. This thing is less than or equal to a n plus 1. You can approximate what the series converges to by adding the first n terms. How far away are you? How far away are you from the actual answer? You're less than or equal to the next term in line. Nikki's asking why we group the terms two by two and said they were positive. You know that a n plus one is less than or equal to a n by assumption in the hypothesis of the alternating series test. So that when you subtract the two, when you bring this to the other side, it's, it's bigger than or equal to zero. So this is positive, this is positive, and so on and so on. They're all positive terms. We don't need the absolute value. Everything's positive. Exactly that. If we estimate it using S10, right, the sum of the first 10 terms, the error would be less than or equal to the 11th term. Exactly that. We'll see this at work in a moment. But first, let's take a few examples from the book. Two. We 
we are asked whether the series converges or diverges, the usual, right? Ian is asking why is everything positive if there's an alternating series? Again, the assumption is that the terms are decreasing. So since a n plus one is bigger than or equal to a n plus two, the difference is positive and same here and so on and so on. Consider this. Right, we have a series with both positive and negative terms. I don't understand the smaller two a n plus one. That, that, that's the assumption. In the alternating series test, two things need to happen. You need a n plus one, you need the terms to be decreasing and going to zero. So that's the assumption. We're making that assumption. Where did the minus one to the n plus one go? It was an absolute value. What is this going to be? It's either going to be one or negative one, absolute value of which is always one. Consider this. Series with both positive and negative terms. The alternating series test does not show divergence if the series does not respect the two conditions. Consider, consider this, a series with both positive and negative terms. So two questions arise naturally. Does the series of absolute values converge? Right, I mean, let's suppose it starts at uh, zero. So does the series of absolute values converge? A valid question. Because if it does, you're done. You know that's the strongest form of convergence. That's absolute convergence. And it will be done. That will be the answer. Now, as it stands, it's not, right? I mean, first of all, now, having taken the absolute values, you now have a series with positive terms. So all the tests we saw before now apply to this. What are you going to do? As it stands, it's not a P-series, but you can rewrite it as a P-series, right? This is 1 over n to the 1 half, where n starts at. Where n starts in one, thank you. Exactly that. And now, now we see that this is a, this is divergent, a divergent P series, where P is one half, less than or equal to one. Chloe is asking how we did that. Well, let's, let's convince ourselves. Right, this is just notation. What is that? This is, when n is zero, that's one over square root of one plus when n is one, that's one over square root of two, plus when n is three, that's one, I mean, uh, wait, 
When n is zero, when n is one, plus when n is two, that's one over root three, plus when n is three, that's one over root four, and so on and so on. You see what's happening? And now we're gonna rewrite this. Now forget, forget this business and look at this. What is that? That's one over square root of n, where n starts at one. All right, does everybody see that? It's an important trick because sometimes it makes everything much easier. And remind me at the end of the class, I'll show you how important that trick is. Because last year I came up with a beautiful proof for some series just using this trick. All right, so conclusion, what's the conclusion? The conclusion here is that the series does not absolutely converge. There's still hope for conditional convergence. There's still hope for conditional convergence. Yep, we just re-indexed the series, absolutely. There's still hope for conditional convergence. And this is an alternating series. So we're going to apply the alternating series test. The limit as n goes to infinity of the stuff, right? I mean, we're putting the negative one to the n plus one aside, and this is your a n. What is this limit? Conditional. We're, we're hoping for conditional convergence. We know the series does not absolutely converge. And right, I mean, this limit is easily seen to be zero. It's one over infinity. So limit is zero. One of the two conditions is met. We now have to prove we now have to prove this, which is equivalent to showing that the ANs are decreasing, right? But, I mean, you know shortcut to that. You know that you can take the derivative. The derivative with respect to n, what is that? That is negative one over two and plus one to the three over two. And this is going to be negative on the interval one to infinity, or zero to infinity in this case, doesn't matter. Right, I'm treating n as x here. You might want to switch to x, and that would certainly be fine. And it is fine to be an integer, you're absolutely right, but you can, you can see it you, you, you understand, of course, that it extends to x immediately. So I was treating n as x. It's the same thing. So now you see that 
all hypotheses are met, hypotheses of the alternating series test. So the series conditionally or converges conditionally. So the, the maximum you're going to get, Chloe, absolutely, from the alternating series test is conditional. Alexal is asking, how does the derivative give us the answer? What does, what does this mean? The derivative is negative. So your function is decreasing. Right, so, so since since n is less than or equal to n plus one, your function is decreasing, so f of n plus one is gonna be less than or equal to f of n, and f of n plus one is one over square root of n plus two is less than or equal to 1 over square root of n plus 1. And that's what you wanted to prove. This is your a n plus 1, and this is your a n. Philip, this is not the integral test. This is the alternating series test. And in the alternating series, you have that decreasing condition again. So the a n plus one less than or equal to a n is ignoring the alternating series aspect. Alternating aspect of the series, yes. It's just to show that the absolute value of the series is decreasing. Right, you're, you're, you're putting aside the negative one to the n, right? You're rewriting this as negative one to the n or n plus one to the n. So the a n is the rest. This is your AN. You're concentrating on just that part. So what is the condition for it to converge? Two conditions. Limit is zero and decreasing. And as Nicholas suggests, alternating series test only shows conditional conver convergence. All right, consider this. Diverges, thank you. Why? As n goes to infinity, this is easily seen to be one absolute value. Absolutely. So what can you say about this limit? This limit will not exist, right? This is gonna to go to one. And when n is even, this is gonna be very close to one. And when n is odd, this is gonna be close to negative one. So it's gonna alternate between one and negative one. This limit does not exist. So what? This limit does not exist. Thus, Victor is back to the original question. If the uh, P-series would have converged, the whole thing would have been absolutely convergent, and you would have been done exactly that. So, so divergence, so series diverges, 
by the divergence test. Absolutely. The divergence test is always in play, right? It always applies. Divergence test does not just apply to series of positive terms. It's always there. If the limit is not zero, that's it. So in this case, we don't have to check for conditional convergence. There's absolutely no hope. No hope at all. This stuff doesn't go to zero. That's it. Your thoughts? What are we going to do? Let's check for absolute convergence. How are we going to check? Well, you see, it's not quite geometric, right? Because of this N business. It's not quite geometric. What? So Louis is suggesting that this converges. Why does it converge? We, Tiffany, suggest to check uh, the divergence test. I'll let you do it. The divergence test will give you zero. Uh, somebody's suggesting ratio test. Let's try ratio test. If we try the ratio test, this is n plus one over two to the n plus one, the whole thing over n over two to the n. You divide it by a fraction. Are we good? Still? Hmm. Well, let's give it a minute. No worries. All right. Excellent. So there we are. You're dividing by a fraction. We're going to multiply by the reciprocal. This 2n cancels. So we're left with a one half, right? You have a, an extra two there. And then a plus one over n. Uh, whatever you want to do, you can do a L'Hopital's rule here. You can split it up into two fractions. Why don't we do that? This is going to be one plus one over n. And as n goes to infinity, this goes to zero, leaving you with a limit of one half. One half is less than one, so series converges. And thus, this absolutely converges. And you're done. How are we doing? Let me share with you. This seems like the good place to do so. My proof that I was suggesting earlier 
this uh, new proof. I, I think it's new. I mean, I, I haven't seen it anywhere. But, uh, right, I mean, uh, let's, you, you can redo this whole thing. Right? I mean, you, you can redo this exercise, right? I mean, what, what is this? This is really, or, or this one here, this is really n times one half to the n. You can redo this exercise for any value of a between negative one and one, right? The limit is gonna give you a, and you're good to go. What I'm suggesting is that this, you, you can apply the ratio test and you get convergence for that series. The thing is though, it doesn't tell you what it converges to, right? All you have is convergence. What does it converge to? So let me show you how you can work out what it converges to. Consider, Consider this series, which you can also show by the ratio test that this converges. Same thing. We're going to do what we did before. We're going to re-index everything, right? If you let, if you let k be n plus one, and this is really the series k squared a to the k, where k, when n is zero, k is one, and when n is infinity, k is infinity. It's just a re-index. And if you're not too keen on that, just write out the first few terms. This is one squared a to the one. Plus two squared a to the two, plus three squared a to the three, and so on. And what is this? This is one squared a to the one, plus two squared a to the two, and so on. You see that they're exactly the same. Now, k, of course, is just a dummy variable. So if I call this n, it's still true. But now, n plus one all squared is n squared plus two n plus one. And this you can expand and you know that the sum of the series, the sum of series is the series of the sum. So this is n squared a to the n plus one plus two n a to the n plus one plus a to the n plus one. And when n is zero, this whole thing is zero. So I can start it at zero. No harm done. I'm just adding zero. And now observe that this is equal to this. So let's rewrite that. What are we saying?
So what are we saying? This is equal to all of this. seem to have overshot this. My mistake. Right, there, there seems to be a slight mistake here. Anyways, look, uh, what are we going to do? This a to the n plus 1, this is really a to the n times a to the 1. So I'm going to take an a to the one outside. And if you bring this over to the other side, you get one minus a times the series. Is equal to whatever remains. And so this series is 1 over 1 minus a times this thing. saying that if you knew what this was, this is just a geometric series, so you know what that converges to. If you knew what this was, you could find the n squared. I should have, I, I, I should not have started with n squared. I should have repeated with just n plus one, getting this, and so on and so on. And then you would have gotten a nice representation for what that was. Maybe we should do it. Maybe we should do it. This is n plus one. Sorry about that. This is n plus one like that. That's what we should have gotten. And this part if you factor out an A, bring it outside, this is N A to the N. So if you equate these two, this is equal to that. this to the other side, same thing, and this is just equal to to that. Again, let me bring an A outside, and now this is just a geometric series. So what does that converge to? That converges to A times 1 over 1 minus A. And so you see immediately that this is A over 1 minus A all squared. Sorry about that. I may have lost you now. But the point is, it's just re-indexing. All we do is re-index. And here I've done it for n plus 1 to the 1. Before I had it 
or n plus 1 squared, and this scales up. You can do n plus 1 cubed, and so on and so on, and you get all of what these converge to. It's a very nice proof, right? Very simple. Very simple. Nothing is assumed or anything. It's just the re-index. So this shows you the power of re-indexing. And it also shows you that, you know, I mean, it's easy to think that there's nothing left to prove in math, but, you know, once in a while, you come up with a nice, simple proof that nobody's seen before. Yes, absolutely. It should be one, but then when n is zero, when n is zero, the first term is zero anyway, so you're adding a zero. Uh, what does it take to publish something in math? Well, so I mean, you know, you're, you're asking, is this publishable? It's not publishable as an important result, but it's, uh, it's, it's nice to show people. It's nice to point out. But we do all these proofs in the tests or exams. I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, I think Professor Humphreys will be writing the exams. We'll see. We'll see what he decides. Let's consider a few other examples. what happened to the sum on the right-hand side. All right, you, you mean this one here? It's just a geometric series, right? That's an L, I'm not sure what L, where, where that is. Where did the A in the first line come from? Second expression, this A here. It used to be N A N plus one, which is just A N times A, and A is a constant, so I'm bringing it up. Uh, somebody's suggesting telescoping series, and perhaps it is, right? except for this pesky negative one business, right? So one of the, so the first term, I mean, let, let's write out the first terms. Let's say the series starts at zero. So this is root one minus root zero, plus when n is one, this is minus one times root two minus root one. So the minus minus, if this minus wasn't there, then it would have been a telescoping sum. But it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. So it's not telescoping, we're in trouble. What are we gonna do? Uh, Dan, I think, I think you're slightly off. Try it. Try, try, look, look at the n squared we already had. I think it's going to be different already. Can you take absolute value? And then it's telescoping. Very good. Very good. So check for absolute. Absolute. 
and we're checking for this. So you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to write down the sequence of partial sums. S2 is the first term plus the second term when it is 1, you get root 2 minus root 1. So these cancel out. And S3 is the sum of the first three terms. is 2, you get root 3 minus root 2, and these cancel out, and those cancel out, leaving you with root 3 minus root 0, and I think we see a pattern, right? What can we say about root n? I mean, sorry, I gave it to you, but uh, I gave it to you, but what are we suggesting about Sn? What is the sequence of partial sums? Root n, very nice. Root big n. So that's our sequence of partial sums. And what is the limit as n goes to infinity? Of course, infinity. So series diverges. In other words, our original series does not absolutely converge. There's still hope for conditional. Can we just use the divergence test for this example? Perhaps. You can always try. I claim the limit will be zero. And in any case, in the alternating series test, we still have to find the limit. So that's going to let's observe what is happening to this business. Is it not root of n plus one? I claim it's root n, right? In, in S1, it was root one. In S2, it was root two. In S3, it was root three. In Sn, it's root n. Uh, I know what you're thinking. You're, you're looking at this and you're thinking to yourself, I've got an n plus one here. So shouldn't it be root of n plus one? Don't make any assumptions. Work with what you have. You wrote down the first term, the sum of the first two terms, sum of the first three terms. This is what you want to describe, nothing else. What is this limit? As n goes to infinity, this has the form infinity minus infinity. Infinity minus infinity. What are we going to do? Multiply by the conjugate. Seems like a reasonable uh, seems like a reasonable suggestion. Pulling out an n might have worked there also. I I claim it would have been. Well, I mean, I'll invite you to do it. I claim it's going to be a lot more work. So let's multiply by one. First of all, you know that infinity minus infinity is an indeterminate form, right? I mean, I, I did not state that yet, but you know that anything can happen. We're going to multiply by the conjugate, root of n plus one plus root of n, 
over itself. And what do we get? n plus 1 minus n over square root of n plus 1 plus square root of n, which is just 1. And as n goes to infinity, you see what's happening here, right? Denominator goes to infinity, 1 over infinity is 0. This tells us that if we had applied the divergence test to begin with, the, di the limit would have been 0, so no conclusion. I mean, you know, it would have been wrong to do so. Still would have been fine. And it's would actually have given us half the work of the alternating series test anyways. So in any case, it has to be done. Very well. The only thing that remains is to show decreasing. Right? And instead of working with this, I can actually work with this. Well, you know, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter whatever you want to do. If you define f of x as square root of x plus 1 minus square root of x, take the derivative, that's 1 over 2 square root of x plus 1 minus 1 over 2 root x. And if you put everything back over a common denominator, this is root x minus root of x plus 1 over 2 root x root x plus 1. The denominator is always positive. x plus 1 is bigger than x, so square root of x plus 1 is going to be bigger than square root of x. And since you're subtracting something bigger, this is going to be less than 0. How do we do? Conclusion, your terms are decreasing, going to zero. So hypotheses of the alternating series test are satisfied. This conditionally converges. Do we have time for an example where we need to approximate and find the error kind of thing? We'll end with that.
Somebody's still not clear on the uh, sine equals root n business. Well, write down some more. Write down more. I mean, we did S1, S2, S3. Write down S4, S5, S6. All good. Can we solve for a n and a n plus one and see if it's decreasing? Assume it's always decreasing. Well, uh, you know, you have to prove it. You have to prove it. All right, here we go. Show that this converges. I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to let you prove that this converges. It actually absolutely converges. I'm going to let you prove that because you know, I mean, we are running out of time. And uh, what we need to do, well, first of all, we have to rewrite this in a fashion that allows us. We have to rewrite it in a fashion that allows us to uh, use the alternating series test. If we have the series AN converges, is the series AN over N always convergent? It is if uh, it was positive. If it's positive, for sure it is. Right, so rewrite the series this way so that it's easier to work with. And we're going to show that it satisfies the hypotheses of the, uh, of the alternating series test. Clearly, the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n3 to the n is zero. And if you define f of x as f1 over x to the 3x, let's take the derivative, which is negative 1 over x 3 to the x all squared times the derivative of the inside, which is 3 to the x plus x 3 to the x one 3. The denominator is positive. This is positive. Everything is positive, except for this negative. So this whole thing is negative on the interval one to infinity. So you know that it is decreasing to zero. It satisfies the hypotheses of the alternating series test. What are we going to do? We showed that if you added some terms, the difference between what the series converges to and if you sum from 1 to n, This is less than or equal to the next term in line. So 1 over n plus 1, 3 to the n plus 1. This is what came out following the alternating series test. So if you can make this, can make this less than 0 0.00005, you're good to go. Because this inequality is only valid if the hypotheses of the alternating series test are satisfied. This is only true
in an alternating series task setting. Not true in general, not true otherwise, only true if your series is alternating, decreasing to zero, well, decreasing to zero. And then there you have it, right? You have to figure out for what value of n is this less than that. And we, of course, want the smallest value of n because we are lazy and we don't want to add too many terms. Right? So, so solve for n, trial and error. As soon as you find one that works, you know all the ones after that work as well because this is a decreasing function. So all you need to do is find one that works, the smallest one. So if n is four, what happens if n is four? One over five times three to the five is what? Anybody with a calculator? Wolfram Alpha. I'm looking for a decimal. Anyone? Shall I work it out? I'll work it out. Does anybody have it? Three zeros and an eight. Thank you. So not good enough. Not good enough. What about n equals five? So that's one over six times three to the six. Three zeros and a two, still not good enough. One more. If I equals six, somebody work it out for us. One, two, three, four zeros and a six, still not good. I think it's going to be clear that n equals 7 is going to work. And n equals 7, what do we get? One, two, three, four zeros and a 1. Everybody have that? Four zeros. And a one, nine something. And that is less than that. So N, N is seven. The question was, for those of you who may have forgotten it, how many terms of the series must we add? So you have to add from one to seven, the first seven terms. So if you add the first seven terms, you're, you know, you can add them using Wolfram Alpha or whatever. You're going to get a numerical approximation. You're going to get, you're going to get a number. And that number will be close 
to whatever this converges to. How close? To within 0. 0.00005. In fact, it's, it's closer than that, but there it is. Dan, this was not proven with the integral test, but rather the alternating series test. We solve for n here, n, n is seven, right? And we're plugging it into this, into the n plus one business, but it's still n equals seven. How are we doing? Yes, 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 Dan, right? This inequality, not, not the integral test though, right? Still the alternating series test business. Very good. Thank you all for coming, folks. So do some exercises from the book and we'll pick this up again on Thursday. You guys have a good one. See you then.